Want to make someone really happy this holiday season? Give the gift of homebrewing. When you purchase an American Homebrewers Association membership gift card, you'll also get a free gift of your choice. Head over to homebrewersassociation.org to learn more about this limited time offer. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, November 17th, 2016. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Mike Tonsmeyer, the mad fermentationist, joins me to talk about brewing hoppy sour beers. He talks about techniques he has experimented with and tastes some hoppy sours that I brewed following his inspiration. If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com. We can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. If you buy any of our DVD combos, you get a free basic brewing bottle opener. And don't forget to get a copy of our brewer's logbook. You can use it to log and track up to 50 batches of beer. You can follow me on Twitter. My username is Basic Brewing, all one word. We also have a Basic Brewing Radio and Basic Brewing Video page on Facebook, facebook.com slash basicbrewing. Thanks again to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our BasicBrewing.com site. Whenever you think of Amazon shopping, think of us first. Go to BasicBrewing.com, click on the Amazon ad on the right-hand side of the page. It won't cost you any extra, and you'll be helping uh, us to bring you this show. We greatly appreciate your support, especially during the busy holiday season that's coming up. We also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Homebrewers Association on our site as well. You can find our Basic Brewing iPhone app on iTunes, our Android app on Amazon.com. We have a Windows phone app. We're on the BlackBerry podcast directory and we're on the Stitcher app as well. We're on Google Play Music and we're on the iHeartRadio app too. And if you want to put a tip in our tip jar, some coinage in our virtual guitar case, you can go to basicbrewing.com slash support. And thanks to everybody who's done so already. It's uh, coming up on the end of the year already, and soon it will be time for our annual Brewing Disaster Show. Every year, Steve and I get together to read your stories of brewing gone wrong. It's a lot of fun, and we award uh, award prizes to our favorite stories. And uh, I've already begun receiving some disaster stories, so if you've got one to share, send it to me at uh, james at basicbrewing.com or use the contact form on basicbrewing.com. The uh, beers that we're sampling on this week's show are the tart 100% rye beers that you may have seen on the most recent episode of Basic Brewing Video. A few days ago, I got a comment on YouTube uh, from someone saying that he didn't like the idea of of low-gravity beers and wanted to see more standard-gravity beers. And then soon after that, I got an email from someone asking advice on how to brew those 100% rye low-gravity beers because that brewer wanted to get into them. So... It just shows you different strokes for different folks. Uh, Those who are not fans of the low-gravity beers uh, can apply the techniques in the latest video to standard gravity, you know, barley beers. For example, using probiotics to provide lacto-souring and uh, adding fruit in the secondary. But uh, have no fear, there are standard gravity episodes coming. I have ingredients for a porter that I'm going to play with for the holidays. Uh, I want to follow the inspiration of uh, Gard Carlsness and uh, add coconut and cocoa nibs. And uh, I want to revisit my mole recipe and add a bit of heat to those uh, roasty chocolate flavors. So I think a split batch is in order. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Next week, we're going to take uh, the week off because of Thanksgiving. Uh, we want to be with our families and such. So uh, we'll be back after the Thanksgiving break with more stuff. Uh, So don't panic when when you don't see a show next week pop up on the feed. Let's uh, take a minute to talk about our sponsors, Desiree and Dave of High Gravity in Tulsa. I told you last week I got a brand spanking new Werthog EBC-130 controller for my electric brew-in-a-bag system. I still haven't had a chance to brew with it yet, but that opportunity is uh, coming up here in the next couple days, I hope. Uh, There are some added features uh, from the uh, EBC-130 over my original controller. It's got a mash mode and a boil mode with linear power control in the the boil mode, so you can really fine-tune the uh, strength of your boil. Accelerated heating with automatic power reduction 
when you're approaching your target temperature, which will help avoid overshooting your, your strike temperature, for example, a timer for mash and boil operations, and it's fully overload protected with a 30-amp main breaker and a 10-amp fuse for the 120-volt subsystem. Uh, the Warthog EBC-130 is one of a family of Warthog electric controllers from high gravity. Uh, mine is a 240-volt, but there is also a 120-volt version of the EBC-130. You can check out all of those uh, controllers along with the turnkey electric systems of many configurations at highgravitybrew.com, and you can see uh, Dave demonstrating the uh, the EBC-130 at youtube.com slash highgravitybrew. So thanks to our folks again at highgravitybrew.com. Okay, let's talk to mad uh, fermentationist Mike Tonsmeyer, proprietor of the Mad Fermentationist blog and author of American Sour Beers on how to brew very tasty, hoppy sour beers. Mike Tonsmeyer, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. It's a pleasure as always, James. You've sent me many beers over the years, and, and I've decided to uh, return the favor this time, and I hope, I hope that it turns out to be a pleasurable uh, experience. I'm sure it will. You've, you've sent me uh, beers a few times over the past. I'm not sure I've actually tasted them on the show, but I've enjoyed tasting them on my own, if that was the case. Well, good. <laughs> uh, this all started, uh, at least part of it started, with your presentation at HomebrewCon back in Baltimore, where you uh, let us sample three hoppy sour beers. And I was really intrigued with the process, and I thought that the beers were really uh, delicious as well. Uh, so I think that, and I have brewed some hoppy sour, or hoppy tart beers, I guess I would call them, uh, as well. And I thought that uh, you could talk about your techniques uh, and then uh, we could kind of uh, taste my beers and kind of talk about, uh, you know, sort of how they compare or, you know, the comparing and contrasting in an essay form. So, <laughs> so, good. so first start off, talk about those beers that you served uh, at the Homebrew Con and what, what was the genesis of that? Sure. Um, really, I was inspired by hoppy sour beers that were being brewed commercially. The first really terrific one I think I had was uh, Le Terroir from New Belgium. That's a um, pale sour. It's their uh, uh, Felix, their pale sour base beer that's aged in fooders with a whole host of microbes. And they take that base beer and Lauren Salazar, their their master blender slash head of uh, the Lips of Face series slash every other wonderful thing, um, <laughs> noticed that one of those fooders produced a beer that had really big tropical mango kind of notes. Uh, and this is probably more than 10 years ago at this point. And she thought, hey, I bet this would be really terrific uh, with a bunch of Amarillo tossed into it. And so she took five gallons and she tried it out and it was delicious. And for a few years there, it would show up at um, festivals and things like that is a, a pretty special um, you know, treat. Once they put their 22 ounce bomber bottling line in, it became a more regular thing. Um, and so the what they tend to do is that it's Amarillo and then plus a little something else. And their their rate is about a pound per barrel of Amarillo and a quarter pound of something else. So it started out with a little Citra, then a little Galaxy, and the 2016 release has uh, Crystal in it. So and, these are all just dry hopped sour beers, essentially. Exactly. So they they do sort of this real long aging process. They blend the beer. They get just the way it is. And then they dry hop the crap out of it. <laughs> and that's a great option um, because that gets around all three of the sort of classic problems with hoppy sours. Um, one of the big reasons we don't generally hear about really hoppy sours is uh, big bitterness and big sourness clash. Um, I don't know if it's an evolutionary biology thing where, you know, it's some signal is being sent to your brain that, you know, you're, you're having alkaloids and acids and this is probably some sort of poisonous plant that you shouldn't be eating. Or if it's just that these flavors for a reason don't show up in nature all that often. Um, and in general, most other flavor combinations work fine. Um, you know, if we have uh, salty and bitter, that's, you know, salted caramel, that's delicious. If we have sweet and bitter, that's maybe a big barley wine or a double IPA. Sweet and sour, obviously, you know, if uh, Lindemann's Frambois or something like that is both sweet and sour. And uh, again, most of these flavor combinations 
Um, you know, bitter and sweet. That's that's a milk chocolate bar, a chocolate bar. Um, work, but for some reason, sour and bitter really just they don't get along together. Um, a little bit of acidity. I mean, all beer is slightly acidic, having a pH generally somewhere in the the range of 4.5 ish. Um, you know, that is acidic, and you know that's what IPAs are, and and there certainly can be tasty at that level. But once you start crossing that um, 4.0 pH line, 3, 3, 8, 3, 9, when you start getting tart, that's where the acidity and the bitterness, again, if you have that really high, you know, IPA type bitterness can begin to clash. And once you get down to 3.4, 3.5, you know, solidly sour, um, even, um, you know, 35 or 40 IBUs could come across as harsh. Mm. Um the other big issue, if you just brew an IPA and throw a whole bunch of microbes in it, is that by the time all those microbes produce their acids and esters and phenols, it's, it's going to be an old junky IPA. I mean, I think we've all had, um, you know, whether it was our home brew or a commercial beer or another home brewer's batch of IPA that was three or four months old, maybe older. And it just, you know, it tasted dirty and, it, the, you know, it loses the, fr- the fresh, bright, citrusy, juicy kind of qualities. And uh, sour beers do have a little bit more leeway. Britannomyces um, is a terrific oxygen scavenger. So you will have I, – I find hoppy sours maybe um, – they don't stay fresh forever, but the, the hop character tends to fade more gracefully. Rather than falling off a cliff, it will sort of – gently um fade and you can certainly have a, a terrific beer um la terroir you know certainly could be good with a little age on it but that hoppy character will will go by the side of the road um and the last real issue with um making a beer that has lots of ibus lots of hops even uh, just on the hot side if you then try to sour it with lactobacillus lactobacillus is very hop hop phobic um when we talk about you know hopping beers being preservative being um, antimicrobial, really lactobacillus is the, the chief microbe that it prevents. And that's very fortuitous. There's lactobacillus all over most brew houses. It's on malted, you know, it's on the grain. Um, it's often on the equipment. And so having 10, 15, 20 IBUs, or, or honestly, even just a big dose of, of hops at flame out can make it very difficult for most strains of lactobacillus, um, particularly those that are not accustomed to a uh, hoppy environment. Lactobacillus very quickly loses its ability to um, fight against hops. So if you have a strain that's hop tolerant, keep you know if you need to culture it up, always add a, a couple of hop pellets just to ma- maintain that uh, that uh, pr- uh, preservative power against lac- uh, against the uh, alpha acids and the other hop compounds. So we have the clash of uh, bitterness and sour. Mm-hmm. We have uh, aging uh, hoppy beer. Uh, in order to sour it, the hop hop character fades, or 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 it becomes less desirable. And exactly. then, uh, if you put a bunch of hops in a beer, the lacto's not going to like it, and it's not going to do its job. Exactly. So in New Belgium's case, and in the case of one of the beers I served at NHC, you simply don't add any, you know, you, very minimal hops. You can serve just like you were brewing a standard sour, you know, maybe five IBUs. You could certainly use some aged hops if you want, um, and then get it as funky and sour as you want, blend it, do whatever you want, and then as if you were brewing an IPA, then you blast it with that dry hop addition. Or you could use a hop tea or um, maybe even blend it with a, with a younger, hoppier beer at that point. But wait, and then, so you're really just, you're not adding a lot of bitterness. Um, dry hopping doesn't add IBUs. It will add some perceived bitterness, but you can make a beer pretty sour and um, honestly, the, the other big one in that category that um, people may have had is it was originally called uh, Cantillon Cuvée de Champions, but it's now uh, Cuvée de Jiwa, I believe, which is their lambic dry hopped with. It tends to be a more sort of classic noble variety, a, a Hallertau or a Styrian Golding, something like that. So the first solution is, as you said, make a sour beer, put a bunch of hops in it. And I'd say I wouldn't necessarily set out to do that. Um, to me, if you're going to age a beer for a long time and it's going to get really perfect, it might be better sort of straight up. Um, to me, it's a great solution. The beer I, I dry hopped for NHC became a little bit too sour. It was down pretty, just a little bit under 3.0 on the pH scale. And it wasn't really that interesting. The nose was just acid and some barrel. 
and dry hopping raises the pH slightly, and it also adds a great aroma. And so it's a it's a fun solution of what to do with a sour beer that might be a little more acidic and not quite as interesting as you'd hoped. Hmm. So it could be a way to fix the beer a little bit. <laughs> yeah, and that's you know when you brew sour beers, you're going to get a real range of things, and that's that's kind of the goal. And um, to me, uh, adding fruit would be what to do if a beer isn't sour enough and it's not interesting. Dry hopping if it's too sour, not interesting. And I would save sort of those best batches for um, straight up enjoyment or blending. So what is another technique that you came up with to get the best of both worlds? Sure. And and as I said, I wouldn't start out with that method. You might end up there. And that's I ended up there after aging that beer for probably – it was a Solera that I probably talked to you about that beer you know, five years ago or something like that. Um, so there are some quicker methods. Um, and uh, one of the ones that you can try, and it actually didn't work super well for me, would be to not add any hops during the boil and just wait and let the whirlpool cool down to 180 degrees or so. Um, so it would, James, you're probably better on conver converting to uh, Celsius than I am. <laughs> 85, uh, let's guess. Uh, 180 would be around 72. 72. Uh, I wasn't close at all. Excellent. Thank, <laughs> thank goodness you're here. Um, to cool down to below the temperature that alpha acid isomerization starts and works best at, um, and then just add a big hop stand addition at that point. You know, infusing those um, great hoppy aromatics, but without the risk of adding bitterness. So that, that checks off the bitter and sour clash. Um, the problem was that, uh, as I learned, uh, adding hops even at 180 and it was a, a nice big dose of citra, amarillo, and mosaic was enough to stop the lactobacillus I added. Mm. Um, and so the beer got mildly tart. Uh, and one of the big issues here is even if lactobacillus starts souring, as the pH drops, the effectiveness of those hop compounds to inhibit lactobacillus goes up. Uh. Um, so it's, it's a lot like if you've ever dealt with uh, metabisulfite. Um, particularly for wine, they make these charts that, you know, if the pH is low, you only need a little touch of it. If the pH is higher, you need more of it. Um, and so if you've ever had a beer where you have, you know, say a Berliner Weiss and you add 10 IBUs or 15 IBUs and you pitch the lactobacillus and it drops down to maybe 3.7 or 3.8, you know, just a little bit of tartness and then stops. Um, I think a lot of people had the impression that it's, uh, it wasn't a good strain of lactobacillus. It wasn't, you know, um, acid tolerant or whatever it was. It really could be those hops. Um, so again, if you're doing like a quick sour, you're going to have to, you know, weave the hopping out until the lactobacillus is done pretty much. Mm. Um, and actually dry hopping can have the same effect. There was a, a cool study. Um, I believe the guy's name was uh, Per Buer uh, posted on YouTube where he uh, took a beer. He was souring with lactobacillus and dry hop part of it and let, let the rest go. And um, dry hopping didn't stop the lactobacillus immediately, but it really, you know, put the brakes on. Um, and that actually might be a great method if you are thinking of souring with lactobacillus, but you don't want loads of sourness. And you also don't want to have the hassle of transferring it back into the fermenter. Um, I'm sorry, back into the boil kettle, heating it up to pasteurize it, chilling it back down again, using all that time and energy and water. Um you know, consider just throwing, a, you know, an ounce or two of dry hops in there that, you know, again, isn't going to stop the lacto in its tracks like pasteurization will, but um, will um, slow it down. And, you know, maybe you pitch brewer's yeast at the same point and that'll ferment out the sugars and, and take away the food source of the lactobacillus and give you a little more control over the, the acid level. Now, if my memory doesn't fail me, you had one more technique during that uh, presentation, right? I did, and this, this in, in some ways is a bit of the, the Goldilocks solution. Um, this one was inspired by um, Jason Yester at Trinity Brewing in Colorado Springs, and the idea is it's a multi-step process. Um, so this one, I started out with um, a you know sort of classic, a, a kettle sour would be sort of the, the standard term, but I tend to use a, a carboy. Um, I lower the pH with bottled lactic acid to about 4.4, that helps to inhibit um, unwanted other microbes, although when you're pitching a pure culture, the biggest benefit you get is that the lactobacillus won't munch down all the protein, so you won't end up with that real uh, sprite pour. You know, it'll actually pour with a little bit of head retention and um, some more body because the proteins have been preserved. 
Um, I'm a huge fan of the Omega Lacto blend, which has a, a Lactobacillus brevis and a Lactobacillus plantarum. Really great, really active, gets a lot of acidity really quickly. Um, after about 24 hours, I'd gotten the pH down below 3.5, which is where I wanted it. I transferred it back into the boil kettle. I heated back up to 180, and then I did the same technique I did on the other one, sort of the 20-minute, 20 25-minute roll pool with the same hops, Mosaic, uh, Citra, and uh, Mosaic, Citra, Simcoe. And uh, so, again, I'm not getting any bitterness from that one. I've already got my acid, so at this point I'm not worried about – uh, inhibiting the lactobacillus. Lactobacillus is, is dead. It's done its job. The pH is already low. And then I pitched, after chilling down, um, a big slurry of Britannomyces bruxellensis vartois vrai, the true Brett strain that White Labs brought out to um, sub in. Well, I guess it wasn't even sub in because they kept selling the, the uh, previous Brett trois as sac trois. And fermented it out, a little dry hop towards the end, as I did for the, the previous beer as well. And that one, I really loved that beer. It had this terrific, like, passion fruit sort of aroma. And that was honestly the most interesting thing about this to me was um, how different the character even of the hop aroma was. All the same hops, but with these different fermentations, these different final pHs, the um, different action of Britannomyces. And I think that was that was the one that seemed to get the best reaction in the crowd. It was certainly the most um, fun and unique and, and sessionable and drinkable and quenching um, and hoppy and tart, but not aggressively sour. Um, yeah, that that yeah. was that was our favorite as well. Uh, the you know the tropical fruit flavors uh, were were delicious, and then the tartness to go along with that, uh, they just paired so nicely together. Uh, and I could have, I could have had a, a lot of that. Uh, <laughs> I, think that, I think that's one of the reason that these beers are gaining popularity is so many of these new hop varieties. Every time a new hop comes out, you look at the descriptors and it's strawberries and melon and yuzu and, um, there are flavors that we associate with acidity rather than bitterness. So I, I took, uh, inspiration from your talk. So I took the third, uh, technique and I adapted it a bit, and I've done this a couple of times. Uh, the first time I used uh, White Labs, is it 677? The lactobacillus? Is that the Delbrookii? The, yes. Um, I've had, I have not had good luck with that one. Yeah, and I, and I, and I used my high-gravity uh, electric brewing system to maintain a temperature of 110 or 120 degrees Fahrenheit over uh, three or four days. Um, and the tartness, I wasn't really impressed with. Uh, so, you know, we made a video about it on, on uh, YouTube and got some comments uh, from people saying, try the Good Belly uh, Mango Plus shot uh, for the uh, the lacto source. You know, this mm -hmm. Good Belly stuff, it's, it's a probiotic, and they use uh, Lactobacillus plantarum. Mm -hmm. uh, so I said, oh, well, that sounds like a great idea. So... This beer, uh, and I guess we can go ahead and, and pour the first one. This is a 100% rye beer. And uh, uh, the latest uh, video of, uh, or latest episode of Basic Brewing Video has this, uh, these beers on it. it for a six-gallon batch, it was uh, five pounds of malted rye, or 2.27 kilograms of malted rye, um, I collected my wort. I brought it up to 180 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 minutes to pasteurize. And then I chilled it down to 120, put it in a carboy, uh, filled it all the way up to the top, you know, pitched the mango shot, two mango shots in there. And then I heard uh, from, you know, other brewers that this mango stuff would work at room temperature. So I set it off in the bathroom, uh, you know, just at room temperature, let it cool down by itself. I kept sampling. I, I, I've yet to break down and get a pH meter. Uh, so I was sampling using, you know, new plastic drinking straws, you know, just kind of, uh, you know, taking samples uh, out, of the, out of the thing and t tasting over the days. And so I wound up, I think, uh, five or six, six days uh, letting the lacto work, 
And then I, I transferred it into the, the kettle again, and I brought it up to 180 degrees Fahrenheit uh, for 15 minutes. And at that point, I added three ounces of uh, HBC 366 Equinox uh, for 15 minutes, cooled that down, and then fermented that with USO5. Uh, so that, that's, that's what you got there in your hand. And, it, it's really nice. The gravity, it is uh, start out at 1024 and ended up at uh, 1010. Uh, so the uh, ABV is about 1.8%. Did you take a gravity reading post-lacto? Uh, d- 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 Out of curiosity? I did not. Do it, so generally with lacto, you won't see much of a drop. Um, then that's actually something I got wrong in American sour beers. Uh Lance Shanner from Omega Labs did a great uh, experiment where he um, really made sure there was no yeast in a couple of lacto samples, pitched it, and the most he ever saw was maybe three, four point drop, about 10% apparent attenuation. Um, if you're getting much more than that, there's a yeast contamination either from your sample or from your equipment or something else. Hmm. Um, but you'll, you'll also know if you didn't see like loads of CO2 being produced and a big crowds in probably what not much going on in terms of fermentation and i would have known because i filled the carboy all the way up to the top uh so you know if there wasn't any activity it would have been coming out of the airlock um so what what are you what are your impressions of the beer no it's funny that you said the mango shot because it really has a little of that tropical mango um without being a mango beer but with with having a, a hint of tropical fruitiness that it walks that line you know it certainly doesn't taste like a sour ipa it tastes more like a, a you know a capri sun or something like that it has <laughs> has a really great um tartness it, it it's it's fun because it you know if you would given this to me I, i'm not going to guess that you know i wouldn't have guessed it's a seven percent beer but it certainly tastes more like a like a you know a, a goza or something like that i mean it really has um you know, it's not thin, it's not watery, it doesn't taste like it is, you know, some, sometimes those beers get kind of grainy, almost they're so diluted out that they no longer taste malty, and this doesn't have any of that. Um, acidity is nice, it's certainly not, you know, a super, you know, acid bomb or anything for the five or six days it took, but in some ways it's actually kind of nice to have um, the culture not work super fast. If If something's going to sour in, you know, 13 hours, but it's going to be too sour in 16 hours, You've really got to base your whole day around tasting that thing and and you know being ready to go whenever that you know a city hits what you like and it's in some ways nice to have have to wait a you know five or six maybe more than you want but um, a little bit slower isn't necessarily worse on a particularly on a homebrew scale where we're not you know using up production time that we could be brewing something else and this was bottled on September twentieth uh, and it, the the hop character the or the the fruitiness has faded uh, over time a bit. Um, and we tasted the, Steve and I tasted the mango shots themselves, and they were more of a, uh, less of a mango flavor, more of a, remember those, the, the ice cream, the orange push-ups? <laughs> of course. The, that's what it tasted like to me. Yeah. Um, and so. No, I, that's, I, that's really interesting. So I think that the fruit that we're getting is not from the shot itself. I think it's either from the hops and or the lacto. Yeah. No, it's it's really interesting. I, I This is a really fun beer, and uh, I'm, I'm glad to have uh, played a small role in inspiring it. <laughs> you played a, a pretty big role, I think. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, uh, I didn't boil it, so it is cloudy. I think I think that if I had boiled it, uh, I would have gotten a protein break and I would have you know gotten a clear beer. But I th- it doesn't bother me that it is cloudy. And, you know, you guys up there in the Northeast. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's uh, coming nationwide now. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? You're ruining the beer, some might say. Uh, <laughs> uh, so anyway, there, there's the base beer. Yeah, I'm. do you get – I mean, everybody says that they, that they get spice from rye. Are you getting the quote-unquote rye spice flavors in there? Hmm. There, there is, there is a, a very, very light um, phenolic-y sort of thing in the nose, but honestly, I don't know if that's um, 
maybe a little yeast stress from fermenting that very uh, acidic um, base beer or – and that's that's one thing that you have to worry about with, with these. If uh, you get the pH really low, yeast is not going to be particularly happy. Yeah, this one fermented more slowly than the, uh, than yeah. the first one I did. Um, one of the tips I got – and actually I, I should have probably mentioned that the December issue of Brew Your Own Magazine has an article that I wrote about hoppy sours – um, and for that, one of the tips I got from White Labs was that uh, if you're making a starter, to lower the pH of the starter a little bit, maybe into the mid threes, and that will help the yeast to acclimate to that acidic environment and slow down the lag time and um, possibly improve the fermentation character. Hmm. So beer number two, mm-hmm. uh, I decided to split this batch and put two gallons of it onto two cans of Oregon tart cherries packed in water. Uh, so that's what this this second one is. Uh, and just, did you add the water as well or just the uh, yeah, I did. The fruit I, itself? I, I, I tasted the water and it, and it tasted like cherries and it tasted a little tart. So I thought, well, why not just uh, you know add that in there and see what happens. Nice pink color. Yeah, it has a pinkish hue, as George said on Seinfeld. And I should say, I think these beers are, are really great for fruit additions. And again, you know, you age that beer for a year and you develop all that subtlety only to really blast it with fruit character. Um, seem, seems like a waste if you really want the huge fruit character. This is a lot more balanced. This is, um, you know, a nice light cherry spritzer kind of thing without being, you know, that big overwhelming, um, you know, cherry jam. Now, I, I think that the cherry beer with the tart cherries is less tart than the original beer. I think you're right, which is which is surprising. And I, I got some feedback from somebody on uh, on YouTube on the second video saying that uh, he experienced the same thing, uh, that by adding fruit to a tart beer, it sort of took some of the, the tartness out. Um, and Steve, Steve suggested that the cherries have sugar in them and maybe that that sugar is sort of sweetening the, uh, the beverage. Yeah, cer- certainly if, if it doesn't ferment out, although being ball conditioned and not pasteurized, I, I would imagine most of those simple sugars are, um, fermented out. Um, normally when you add fruit to a beer that still has lactobacillus and, and Britannomyces in it, you're sort of feeding those microbes as well and can... You know, that may help to increase the city, but in your case where you just have American ale yeast, um, that's less of a concern. Um, the cherries themselves certainly often do have some acidity, you know, malic that they're, they're adding themselves, but this one certainly doesn't get, uh, does, doesn't um, taste a lot more acidic. It may just be that the fruitiness is playing with our perception. I get a little bit of almost um, kind of a, um, a cinnamon characteristic. No, I I hadn't uh, I hadn't tasted that before. You know, I can certainly see that. I I actually had um probably what now eleven years ago I brewed a hundred percent Brett uh, Mo Betta Bretta uh, Port Brewing Lost Abbey Pizza Port inspired beer, and I had um, dried sour cherries to that, and that got a real cinnamon fall spice thing. Hmm. So it may be some you know interaction of of um, yeast and fruit and who knows what else. Now, I had a question that I wanted to ask, and I almost forgot. The, you know, the feedback that I, uh, that I read on the forums and that I got from, from people via email and comments mm-hmm. said that, uh, you know, the, the, the lacto in the good belly shot worked very quickly, even at room temperature. And, uh, you know, like sometimes overnight or over two days. Sure. Could... The fact that these are so low in gravity, could that have something to do with the fact that they took longer? Um, it certainly could. Uh, normally, lactobacillus, many strains of lactobacillus aren't particularly attenuative. They're not very good at, at more complex sugars. And so that, you know, they don't need all of even that, you know, that 1024 would be more than enough sugar if it was all simple sugars. And so it may be that what could have helped is if you had added um, – even, uh, you know, a quarter pound of glucose, you know, of, of dextrose, um, just to give those uh, lactobacillus, again, in that low gravity environment, something that was very easy to ferment. Hmm. Um, 
Did you did you mash particularly hot on these? I don't I don't remember the specifics. Uh, did it, did it uh, 150 degrees Fahrenheit or 65 oh. C? Okay, so not 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 you know nice middle of the range kind of uh, mash. Right. Um, what I often do with lactobacillus, I, I I will sour at room temperature, but I'll only chill to you know 100 or 110, pitch the lactobacillus, and then let it cool the rest of the way on its own. Yeah, um, giving yeah. it some time at that elevated temperature uh, to, to get as sour as it can. Yeah, that's that's what I did on the, on this one. Um, hmm. I'm just uh, and I didn't ha I didn't add any uh, lactic acid, you know, to lower the pH before I added the the lactobacillus. Um, I like the, the other the other thing you can could consider would be making a small starter. Although I know for these little batches it seems a bit silly, but um, even something like apple juice is pretty common for a lactobacillus starter. Just again, simple sugars, no hops, um, and that way. That lactobacillus, you know, hits the ground ready to go. You're sure that it's going to sour, and that's not just sort of, you know, going to hang out for a couple of days before getting active. At which point, you, you know, if your sanitation isn't pristine, you could have other problems. I, uh, uh, I want to try this again with a standard gravity uh, barley beer because yeah. because if I did a, if you do a standard gravity rye, hundred percent rye beer, you get snot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, which, which you know, you can use to your advantage if you if you cut the grain bill, and you, then you can mm -hmm. get you know two percent beers that that taste like something or feel like something yeah. on your tongue. But yeah, I'd like to try just try an experiment, and just do like a you know ten fifty gravity you know barley uh, beer and see if it see if it sours more quickly and more dramatically yeah, uh, under I, the same conditions. That'd be that'd be interesting to find out. Okay, beer number three. I went to the grocery store and I went to the frozen food section and I got uh, a one pound bag of peach slices and a one pound bag of mango chunks. And so I put two gallons of the base beer on that. And I'm interested to taste this one. I actually, uh, recently uh, wrote up a post on I, I aged the same beer on fresh mango and store bought frozen mango. And, and the frozen one really had a lot more punch to it than the uh the fresh one huh oh wow that's a that's a fun aroma mm. well, it's that the peach and the mango really work well together yeah i really get i really get more of the peach than i do the the mango uh in an, in an earlier tasting the reason i wanted you to have three glasses yeah. was that i get i got more mango character out of the base beer than I do out of the beer that has the mangoes. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I, I think I do as well. Um, and it, it definitely is that peach seems to be the dominant, although it, it is a little bit more, um, maybe generically tropical would be a good way to put it than normal straight peach beers are. And there's a, there's a teeny bit, it seems like the peaches or the fruit brings a, just a teeny bit more sort of astringency, not in an unfavorable way, but... Hmm. At least to my palate. Yeah, no, it's 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 really nice, and and again, this one doesn't taste quite as sour, I think, as the um, the base beer did. Mm -hmm. I agree. I, I I'll I'll be interested after after we're done. I may uh, dust off the pH meter and uh, and and check these three out and let you know how they actually compare uh, reading wise and not just palate wise. Yeah, that would be that'd be really interesting. This is James from the future. Uh, after the discussion. Mike was kind enough to apply his pH meter to the beers. The plain weighed in at 3.32, the cherry 3.38, and the peach 3.44. So what what are your what are your general impressions compare and contrast the three of them? I mean which which ones do you like the best? Um, so honestly, I'm, I've never been the biggest fan of pale cherry beers. And that is just like a personal thing. Um, for me, I love, I love cherries and darker beers. I, I feel like they can be um, so one note. It's nice for them to have some maltiness, some toastiness, some roastiness to, to play off of. Um, but this is, I think, a, a really nice pale cherry beer. It's, it's pretty restrained compared to um, a lot of them. I mean, it's not, you know, it doesn't taste like cherry juice. Um I, I'm I'm just a huge fan though of of relatively more straight up beers. I 
I think we all know fruit tastes delicious, um, and it certainly can make a delicious beer, and I love brewing fruit beers. But there's something about drinking a beer that is that gets interesting flavors not by the addition of mango, but by uh, that synergy of hops and fermentation and um, you know whatever that lower pH is doing, whether it's uh, freeing glycosides from the hops or whether it is you know helping with biotransformation or you know it's I, I and and honestly. Um, you know, the, these hops themselves are, are a little, you know, tend to be a little bit more, um, uh, you know, Simcoe. You know, they they can be a little free, but they also have some piney to them. Um, e- Equinox, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that they. I don't think of them as being a, you know, a tropical fruit bomb. And so this technique has really um, altered their perception, altered what you're getting out of them. And and to me, that's a lot more interesting than sort of flavoring a beer with fruit, as delicious as that is. So you're liking the plain one? I think so. If you if you ask me if if I if I polish off these three and and I go back for a, for a second pour of one of them, it may be that it may be that one with a little of the um, the the peach uh, mango blended into it to see how that um, interaction goes. Hmm. Oh, one thing that I didn't uh, that I admitted was on the beer where I put the peaches and mangoes. Uh, it developed a pellicle <laughs> over, uh, I think, two weeks. And I sent you a picture because it kind of scared me. So, oh, that's right. <laughs> and you thanks, s- thanks for not reminding me that before I tried the beer. <laughs> well, I've, I've, had, I've had a few of these and I haven't died. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so they give you immortality. Interesting. <laughs> so far. <laughs> The dog keeps the elephants away. Uh, <laughs> no, but uh, but uh, you you said it's hard to tell from a photo, but it, it kind of looks like a, a wild yeast pellicle. So yeah, they tend to be a little dustier, a little um, less uh, smooth and rubbery, is what a lot of the more bacterial ones, particularly acetobacter, look like. And this this clearly doesn't have any you know vinegar, no acetic acid, so. Um, and I'm not I'm not getting any wild character other than you know just the tartness from the uh, from the lacto. Um, I agree. So so I'm assuming that the, that it came with the fruit uh, from one one of the other bags of fruit. Um, so the uh, the appearance to me is interesting because it's cloudy. Um, you know, I get like I say. I guess if if I wanted to clear it up, I could I could take it to up up to boil and then bring it back down as you did on one of your batches. Uh, but you know, that's that's extra time and extra energy. Um, and I'm not. It unha- doesn't make the beer taste any better. Yeah, and I'm not unhappy with this. So yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm, uh, I'm kind of happy with these. I, they're they are very uh, refreshing uh, and uh, interesting. And like you said, they're not watery. Um, no. And if you're looking for, you know, fairly low calorie and, and low alcohol, but but yet, you know, a beer, uh, I think that this is is something for people to take a look at. Yeah. No. Agreed. I, I don't know if I've done this particular rant for you, but and to me, there's nothing worse than a beer that doesn't that belies its strength. Um, you know, if if you're gonna make a beer that tastes like it's eight percent alcohol better than six percent alcohol than twelve percent um i understand the fun and the technical challenge of brewing a a big beer that's smooth but i'd much rather a small beer that i could have three of um and still cook dinner and still uh you know get get home safely rather than a beer that was so smooth that i you know could only have half of one and that you know would be blown over the limit yeah yeah well this is a like i say you 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 inspired this experiment uh, and it's a it's kind of a blending uh, of processes, you know, because I'm I'm on this track with the, you know, the 100 percent rye beers at the low uh, ABV, uh, and I'm just trying to do different things with them. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, so your your presentation uh, came at a good time. Yeah, no, it's it's always fun to do those, and it was great to have it close by so I could actually bring some beer along to it. And they spend... I, I think these are the sorts of things you when, when you get to taste it, it, it really is, um, you know, decide for yourself. It's really interesting. 
the uh, uh, and and the beers spent some time uh, in my bathtub uh, at the uh, hotel. So <laughs> that's right. And, and Andy sat in uh, in the Solera dry hop beer because it <laughs> spilled in the back seat of my car before I picked you guys up. <laughs> yeah, we had funky butts there in the back. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Adventures in homebrewing. <laughs> well, awesome. Is there is there are there any tips that you would give to to uh, improve the beers uh, or any twists? You know, for the next round or, or you know what what would you what would you uh, suggest? I I think you certainly could take them a little more acidic. Um, for my taste, you know that they are very um, approachable and bright and and all of that. Um, you could also certainly consider you no know, the the first one wasn't dry hopped, correct? It was just just those um, uh, acidic whirlpool hops, whatever we're going to call them. Right. It's certainly fun. Um, for mine, I did for a five gallon batch. I, I dry hopped with a half an ounce of each of the three varieties. So trying not to overwhelm them, but also um, trying to get a little bit more um, you know zip to the hop aroma. Um, and I, you know, that's certainly a fun thing. Although again, I didn't try this one, um, two months ago now when, when it was, you know, fresh. So, you know, as, as a beer ages, it's of course going to lose some of that character. So it's, it's, um, you know, beers that are, uh, often best fresh. Um, and I mean, the other thing you could consider too, is going the hundred percent Brett route. If you wanted to get in a little bit more, um, funky, complex, interesting, but still not add that much time to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Although you know, another great thing about these, you know, these quick sour methods is if you don't have that separate set of equipment, you don't have to risk um, contaminating anything. Um, it really is rel- a relatively safe way to um, get your feet wet with sours, and I think that's one of the big reasons we see not only uh, home brewers but a lot of commercial breweries, and including one around here that does Good Belly as well for their um, their sour beers that are uh, soured in the kettle. Really. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh... Up at the uh, Ozark Brewing Company, uh, Andy Coates, I hear, uses um, yogurt uh, to, for, to sour his uh, Berliner Weiss, to kettle sour his Berliner Weiss. Yeah, I've, I've heard of uh, more more than just a couple breweries doing that as well, although it, I don't know if they – I think they often sort of take the whey and maybe grow that up, you know, sort of uh, the microbes based on the yogurt, not maybe uh, a couple of – gallon you know containers of yogurt itself <laughs> yeah i don't know i don't know the technique i need to get up there and and talk to andy about that but um so there's lactobacillus grows very quickly though so you know really you know even yeast grows quickly lactobacillus grows even faster wow well this has been fun i appreciate your your uh your uh, adventurous spirit sir <laughs> thank you can, can can i plug can i plug one thing you sure can yes. Yeah, I, I just got back um, last weekend. I was in Burlington, Vermont for the first uh, Brew Your Own boot camp uh, with Chris White and uh, Sean Lawson and Gordon Strong and Ashton Lewis and a whole bunch of other people. Um, There's sort of full day, like six and a half hours, including an hour for lunch. Uh, I did sour beers and I did barrel aging for the sour beer one. People got to blend a couple of my homebrewed sours. Uh, uh, we talked all sorts of microbes. Uh, for the barrel one, we took apart a 60-gallon wine barrel that was donated by uh, a brewery up there, Foam Brewers. Um, we made oak and sarsaparilla and uh, hard maple and soft maple teas, and we tasted uh, the same beer, a big brown ale that I'd aged in a little five-gallon whiskey barrel infused with whiskey and uh, aged just on plain oak. Um, we're going to be doing the same thing again with with some of the same people, and but also with Vinny Chalurzo and Sean Paxton and a few others in Santa Rosa in February, uh, and then we'll be doing Indianapolis at some point uh, later on in the year, and hopefully it's the sort of thing that they do a couple of every year. And if you're interested, go to to Brew Your Own uh, their website uh, and uh, sign on up and and come come on, hang out, brew some beer, drink some beer, have a good time. Well, that sounds like a blast. Well, thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. Excellent. It's always a pleasure to be on, James. And uh, even more so, I get to drink your delicious beers instead of having to drink my own junk. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks again to Mike. If you like hoppy beers and you like sour beers, the techniques Mike talked about really work. Uh, Those beers that he served at uh, HomebrewCon 
or very inspirational. And, uh, of course, be sure to check out his Mad Fermentationist blog and his book, American Sour Beers. Don't forget to send in your disaster stories. Uh, if you have a disaster stories, uh, brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to James at basicbrewing.com, or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our support link where you can throw a couple of bucks into the tip jar by subscribing financially to our podcasts. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site. Get a free Basic Brewing bottle opener with any DVD combo. You can check out our free Basic Brewing shirts. Or not, whoa, you can just... <laughs> Automatic Pilot goes off the rails. You can check out our Basic Brewing shirts in the store, too, which are not free, uh, <laughs> as well as our log books, where you can track and log up to 50 batches of beer. Check all those out at basicbrewingshop.com. I need to eat lunch. Thanks again to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Featured products this week that are purchased through the link are... Vegetti Spiral Vegetable Slicer makes veggie pasta. Hmm, that's a lunch thing. And Swagtron TIUL2272 certified hoverboard electric self balancing scooter. Marty McFly would be proud. It, who knew hoverboards would be a real thing? Thanks again, everybody. And remember, I can't tell who bought what money. Uh, but uh, so no worries there. Just click on the uh, Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like it. Amazon shopping, we greatly appreciate your support. Don't forget, you can also join the American Homebrewers Association and subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine through the associate links on basicbrewing.com. That's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dotson, Basic Brewing Radio. Is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.